and action! Was it a little intimidating last season in the beginning? <laughs> My first impression of Dr. Ekman. Hmm. Here is the really interesting thing about Paul Ekman. I'm scared to be around him. Yeah, I was very um, kind of paranoid when he was around. You just assume that he is going to just like peer right into your soul and he's going to basically give you a printout of all, all of your bull. It's very weird talking to somebody who can read what's happening to you. So there was a lot going on and yes, I was self-conscious at first when Dr. Eichmann was there watching us do a scene because I wanted to be a good student, you know what I mean? Or do it well. Dr. Eichmann, is she telling the truth? Seriously, absolutely. I am. I guess I would say the inspiration for Lie to Me was that I had been thinking a lot about the things that we don't tell the truth about. I had done some research into the science of lying and very quickly came across the work of Dr. Paul Ekman and discovered that there was this whole science of deception detection. And the nice thing about doing research on Dr. Eckman is it's right there, he wrote the books. I was actually really into his science long before the show came on the air. I can't get enough of the guy. The way that he looks at people and people's motivations is, is really just fascinating as a fan. He's pretty cool. As far as research goes, I just read all of Ekman's books. Well, not all of them. That was a lie. Dr. Ekman participates in the show first by reading the outlines when we turn them in, and he gives some thoughts and gives some suggestions of how science might play a role in those stories. And then when we write the scripts, he and Erica Rosenberg, who studied under him, they both read the scripts and they're technical consultants on the show, and they'll weigh in on, on the science. And he's respectful enough that he knows that the decision's ours. How did uh, Tim Roth come into the picture? Sure. Now he just showed us a beautiful micro-expression of a little bit of distress. How did uh, Tim Roth come into the picture? Wait, no, stop. There's right when he reaches for the cup, something's going on. There's lots of brown. Yeah. I saw three things. Yeah. Yep. So I think it, right here at first, that? you've got a one and a four, right? And then, and then I think you have a four intensifying to maybe a D level. Now, I don't know what the distress is about, but I do know he's concealing it. I can't tell from a micro expression whether he's even aware of what he's concealing because micros look exactly the same. They're the product of unconscious repression or deliberate conscious suppression. But it was a beauty. Well, Tim Roth had originally said that you know he was, he was not going to do American television. He was not interested in serious television. It was a very, very challenging part to cast. And eventually, we came back and said, well, what about Tim Roth? Let's, you know, let's really uh, see if we can interest him. What about Tim Roth? He pulls his eyebrows together. Now, when you pull your eyebrows together with a question, it means you don't know the answer to it. He said, what about Tim Roth? He's got a pretty good idea Tim will do it. What about Tim Roth? He doesn't know that he has a chance at all. And he read the script, and the two of us had lunch, and uh, I think about two days later, uh, he was in, so. What happened during that lunch? <laughs> uh, it's a great mystery what happened during that lunch. Um, I'll never tell. I've been during that lunch. One. Yeah. Um, I'll never tell. There. There. Yeah. Yeah. Something must have really been interesting that went on to lunch, and he hasn't decided how much of it he can tell you, because maybe he'll put it in the DVD. Do you like working on a television show as opposed to feature films? What is the difference for you in terms of your own experience? I actually really enjoy it. I was hoping you were going to say that. I mean, it's a completely different world. Um, it's exhausting, and it and it's. Brutal, the amount of work that you that you put in in a day compared to what you put in on film. I'm my own boss. That's a 24/7 job. Because it's a big machine that's kind of chugging forwards. You hope, and you know you hit the rocks sometimes. But I still think that that's a great place to be. Dod friend of mine right. said this guy's a total nut job. 
but he spent like three years in the African jungle with some primitive tribe studying their eyebrows. Soon after I got my PhD, I began working on gesture and expression. And it was clear that facial expression was very rich, but there were no methods for measuring it. And there was a fundamental argument between Margaret Mead, who said it was another culture-specific language, and the earlier writings of Charles Darwin, who said it's universal to the species. To answer that question, I needed to study people who were totally isolated, who could not have learned their expressions from the media, from seeing Westerners. They were the critical case, and there weren't many of them left. And so in 1967, I went to the highlands of New Guinea, and I studied people where I was really, for most of them, the first outsider they had ever seen. They were still using stone implements. They had no written language. They had very little clothing. Um, I worked in a number of villages. I was a source of great entertainment. To them, I'd light a match. It was a miracle. Turn on a flashlight. They never see anything like this. And most important, they didn't know what a camera was. So when I would hold one up and take photographs or films, they weren't self-conscious because they just figured I was doing another one of my funny, strange things. The evidence I gathered in two trips there, 67 and 68, decisively proved that Darwin was more right than Mead. And really, up until the last 100 years, human beings were not able to see themselves in motion. Photographs go back another 60 to 80 years. I mean, most of the time, 99 of the time human beings are on this planet, maybe if you were rich you got a drawing that someone made of you. You never got to see yourself or your loved ones. And suddenly this technology has changed it. It's unimaginable for us to remember this is new. This is a new human experience. It's changed our lives. We studied almost 10% of the people of that culture, and the results were extremely robust, very strong. So the seven universal emotions are fear, anger, sadness, disgust, contempt, surprise, and enjoyment. These expressions are universal. Emotion looks the same whether you're a suburban housewife or a suicide bomber. The truth is written on all our faces. That was huge work because it showed that the face could be a reliable sign of emotion for all humans. You know, people in a very remote, preliterate culture showed the same basic facial expressions of emotion or recognized the same set of emotions as people in, you know, San Francisco. And it served to renew interest in the field of emotion. Up until then, it was a dead field, but now, People got very excited, and I spent the next eight years developing a technique for quantifying and measuring all the movements the face can make, which I call the facial action coding system. And that was published in 78. It took me eight years, a long time. But it opened everything for science, for teaching. It's used by all the animation studios when they want to animate expression. I would never have really discovered micro-expressions if I didn't have this tool that allowed me to look so precisely at everything the face did. What do you see? Sadness. Yeah, um, I met Dr. Ekman uh, probably within the 
first week that we were shooting the pilot. I've only met him like twice and he's lovely. Microfacial expressions are very brief facial expressions, usually about a 25th of a second. It could be as long as a fifth of a second. They are always the sign of an emotion that's being concealed. He's lovely. Now, she says he's lovely and shows us distress in her eyebrows. I mean, that's Huge. like the cl most classic one sad distress display. You know, it reminds me of that one in the fax manual. Now, one way of interpreting that, instead of being classical distress or anguish, she's showing an empathetic, yes, she cares about me. She cares about the fact that I'm a lovely person. But you could say it's a little odd, I mean, you know. He's really, he's really a compassionate guy. Well now, if she had done that with the word compassionate, it would have fit much better. But maybe she had the thought of he's a compassionate guy, showed us on the face, and then told us about it. It's another possibility. He had a really good energy about him. I liked him.